So good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. I appreciate uh, you being here. My name is Jeff Cron. I'm the co-chair of the business department at Tonkin, and I'm the moderator for today's program. Uh, this webinar's title is PPP Forgiveness, Now, Later, or Never. And our goal is to provide you with practical advice for addressing the important recent changes to the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program forgiveness rules stemming from the enactment of the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, a, a mouthful, uh, and we're going to refer to that as the Flexibility Act in this presentation, uh, adopted on June 5th, and then subsequent updates to related rules. Uh, this is the third webinar we have provided on PPP issues, and we expect to provide at least two more. Uh, the primary PPP questions we have been addressing for our clients have evolved from how to get the money to whether to keep the money to now how to prepare for loan forgiveness. All of these questions have been made more difficult for borrowers because the PPP was passed on March 27th and implemented one week later on April 3rd in response to the broad economic shutdown caused by the pandemic. It was not adopted and implemented by proposed rules and then final rules over several months, as is the case with most new laws. Instead, guidance with respect to the operation of the PPP has been incomplete, inconsistent, and regularly subject to change. Through yesterday evening when I looked, the SBA and the U.S. Treasury have now published answers to 48 frequently asked questions on the operation of the PPP and 18 interim final rules, including revisions to interim final rules and now revisions to revisions to interim final rules. Wow. Understandably, many businesses have found it very difficult to plan to use PPP loan funds with substantial confidence that the loan proceeds will be forgiven. Some business owners have commented that it is one thing to spend their own funds, but that they are not interested in incurring a bank debt that may not be forgiven and that they may not be able to repay. The Flexibility Act is the most recent source of significant change to the terms of the PPP. It was enacted to address the concerns of bars, restaurants, hotels, and many other so-called non-essential businesses subject to state shutdown orders. These businesses complain that the original terms of the PPP made it impossible for them to take advantage of loan forgiveness because they were forced by law to remain closed through the period during which the PPP required that employees be working and paid. In big picture then, the Flexibility Act loosened the PPP's loan forgiveness terms in the following ways. First, it extended the covered period for forgivable expenses from eight to 24 weeks. Next, it changed the required allocation of payroll versus non-payroll costs eligible for forgiveness from 75-25 to 60-40. Then it extended the safe harbor period for restoring employee headcount from June 30 to December 31 and it provided additional safe harbors for loan forgiveness reduction resulting from employee headcount reductions. My business department colleagues, Drea Schmidt and Ferdy Ruplin, both of them have worked extensively on PPP issues since the adoption of the act, will lead us through a detailed review of the changes made by the Flexibility Act and some of the strategic questions it creates for PPP borrowers. After their comments, we will conclude with the Q&A session addressing questions raised by attendees before and during the webinar. If you have questions for us on the Flexibility Act and related issues during the presentation, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A section of your Zoom app. If you have detailed questions unique to your business, we invite you to reach out to our panelists directly after the program or to the Tonkin Torp lawyers you normally work with to discuss your specific situation. And finally, we welcome any feedback you may have on this webinar. If there are additional topics you would like for us to address, please ask. As I mentioned, we plan to hold at least two more sessions on loan forgiveness issues. So your comments will be useful to us 
as we plan the content of our subsequent programs. Now then, let's get to the substance of this program and my first question, which is for Drea. Drea, one of the features of the Flexibility Act borrowers have heard a lot about is the availability of a longer covered period. What is the expanded covered period under the Flexibility Act and what will it mean for borrowers? Thanks, Jeff. So as you point out, this is one of the most useful and talked about changes to the PPP that was made by Congress. Uh, the Flexibility Act extends the uh, covered, the loan forgiveness covered period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. The new 24 week period is retroactive and it applies to all PPP loans but borrowers who took out loans before June 5th actually have the option um, to keep their eight week, their original eight week covered period. So what this means um, for borrowers is that they're going to have the option to spend the proceeds of their PPP loan on permitted purposes over 24 weeks instead of that initial eight week period, which was proving really problematic for uh, particularly some, for some folks. Um, and I think it's going to be particularly important for borrowers who took out a PPP loan, but then have had to remain partially or fully closed um, for all or even a significant portion of their loan forgiveness period because of COVID-19. So the 24 week period is going to be really helpful for restaurants and retail shops, for example who took out PPP loans only to be faced with either paying employees not to work or not being able to use funds during their eight week period at all. So, I, I mean, of course, I think one of the things that we are finding is that there are some, some restaurants and similar borrowers who already opted to try to pay employees not to work in order to make sure that their loans would actually be forgivable under previous rules. So unfortunately, this relief may be a little bit too late for some people. Thanks, Drea. Uh, you mentioned that borrowers can choose to retain an eight week covered period. Are there certain borrowers for whom retaining an eight week covered period will make sense? What circumstances would lead a borrower to opt for eight rather than 24 weeks? Yeah, so first I, I should clarify that uh, loans approved after June 5th must use a 24 week covered period. So those borrowers actually don't have an eight week option. But so far, the vast majority of PPP loans have been taken out prior to June 5th. So most borrowers are going to have a choice to make. And I think for some borrowers, it'll be pretty clear which option makes the most sense. Um, for example, at this point, nearly a third of all borrowers will have concluded their original eight week loan forgiveness covered period by this week. And for many of those borrowers that they've presumably already spent much of their PPP funds in a way that they believe will maximize forgiveness based on original rules. And, you know, I think for those borrowers that have spent their PPP funds and they're comfortable that their loans are going to be forgiven, it may make good sense to go ahead and seek forgiveness based on the original eight week period. Um, and I think the other thing that's important here is that many borrowers are interested in the certainty that comes along with being able to go ahead and apply for loan forgiveness and get that loan off their books. But on the other hand, on the other side of the spectrum, there are also lots of borrowers out there who haven't been able to spend their funds on regular payroll because they've been closed or because their business has slowed down significantly. Um, and those borrowers are more likely to want to take advantage of a 24 week period. And I would also say that that is likely especially true for borrowers who are now expecting to ramp up 
their business up to a normal or close to normal FTE level for the 24 week period. We can talk a little bit more about FTEs in a bit, but I think that that's, that's gonna be one of the important components. But in the middle of that, there are gonna be a lot of borrowers who don't fall clearly into one camp or the other, and they will need to make a decision here and decide whether it makes more sense for them to go with an eight week period or for them to go ahead and extend their loan out for 24 weeks. And for those folks, I think your best bet is gonna to be to walk through both scenarios uh, with your CPA, with your advisors, based on your specific situation and see which, see which scenario works the best for you and for your business. So the borrowers need to perform that analysis, then do they, they need to decide now which covered period they want to use or can they wait, make that decision later? Um, is there a reason not to wait? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. So the forgiveness application that the SBA released on May 15th still needs to be updated. And we're not going to know exactly what the process is for affirmatively selecting what your loan forgiveness covered period is until we have an updated application. So borrowers do have some time and even then you're not you're not required to apply for forgiveness right away. So it seems like borrowers should be able to wait and see if we get a little bit more clarity and a little bit more guidance um, to be able to take some time and think about what situation makes the most sense for them. I do think that there's one situation where folks are gonna wanna think about making, a making some strategic decisions now. So let's say you're ending the, new, the end of your initial eight week period and you're trying to decide whether you want to spend the rest of your PPP loans during that eight week period in a way that will make the, those proceeds forgivable. For example, I, I know of a lot of folks who have decided that they were maybe gonna play, pay employee COVID bonuses or something like that um, during their eight week covered period in order to make the, the full pot of money forgivable. Um, or you're trying to decide whether you want to instead keep that money and pay payroll over a longer period of time. For those folks, if, if you decide to wait and you don't use the funds now, but then you decide later that the eight week period makes the most sense for you, then that could be a situation where some portion of your loan doesn't end up being eligible for forgiveness. Thanks, Drea. Uh, Freddie, the next question is for you. Another significant change from the Flexibility Act was the modification of the required allocation of payroll and non-payroll costs. There's a lot of complaints about the 75-25 split previously. What is the new payroll versus non-payroll ratio for loan forgiveness? And can borrowers still obtain partial forgiveness if they fail to meet the new ratio? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And, and thanks, everybody, for joining us here today. Um, so, Jeff, as you mentioned, and I'm, I'm sure everybody knows this, but prior to the Flexibility Act coming along, the, the Treasury and SBA implemented that requirement that borrowers allocate at least 75% of the total amount of their loan forgiveness toward payroll costs and only 25 percent could of that forgivable amount could be attributed to non-payroll costs like rent utilities and mortgage interest and in an effort to alleviate the burden on borrowers who are you know shut down or operating at limited capacity um, congress changed that 75 25 ratio to a 60-40 ratio in the Flexibility Act. Um, so now borrowers only need to make sure that 60% of their forgivable amount is attributed to payroll. 
Um, and I've received a couple of questions. Um, some clients have asked if they can spend more than 60% of the loan on payroll. And the answer to that is yes. Um, that 60% threshold is a minimum requirement. Um, so as long as you meet that, then you won't have a reduction in your loan forgiveness. Thanks, Freddie. Uh, the Flexibility Act also provides for the extension of the repayment term for PPP loans from two to five years. How exactly does this extension work and is it available to all borrowers? Yes, so the, the extension of the repayment term to five years is automatic for all loans that were entered into on or after June 5th, as you mentioned, the date that the, the Flexibility Act was signed into law. Um, if you received a PPP loan before June 5th, um, you can reach out to your lender to see if they would be amenable to extending the term from two to five years. Uh, you know, some lenders may not want to keep 1% interest loan uh, loans on their books for longer than they need to, but you know, it's it's worth having that conversation with your lender if if you feel like you won't be able to have your entire loan forgiven and you'll want that extra time to repay off the loan. Thanks, Ferdy. Uh, Drea, back to you. Um, everyone that's worked actively in PPP has become an expert on FPEs. How do you count them? Who are they? When do you measure them? Um, we've got some additional changes to FPEs PE rules, they seem to come out every couple of days. The Flexibility Act changes the deadline use for FTE safe harbor for rehiring employees and adds new exemptions. Can you recap how the loan forgiveness for FTE reduction works and explain what's changed in the last few days with the Flexibility Act? Sure. Uh, and, you know, I, I think a lot of people are becoming experts on this um, as we work through all these calculations, but, but it, it is complicated. Uh, so I, I appreciate everyone bearing with me. Um, so as a reminder, even if you use your PPP funds during your applicable loan forgiveness covered period, and you spend all the required 60% on payroll costs, and you spend 40% on other permitted payroll costs, or non-payroll costs, excuse me, your loan forgiveness can still be reduced in a couple of different situations. Um, I've heard these called, called the, your loan forgiveness haircuts. Um, and that can happen where you reduce your, the number of full-time equivalent employees during your loan forgiveness period, or where you reduce salaries by more than 25%, on employees who make more than $100,000 per year, or again, excuse me, less than $100,000 per year during your loan forgiveness period. So those are the two potential reductions that you could experience. And before we get into how the safe harbor date extension that we learned about with the Flexibility Act and the new exceptions that came into play, before we get into all that, I want to pause on one important point that relates to how your new loan forgiveness covered period relates to the FTE reductions and your salary reductions. Based on what we know so far, if a borrower takes advantage of the new 24 week loan forgiveness period, it appears that they also will need to maintain their average FTEs and salary levels for that 24 week period or qualify for a safe harbor, which is the, the next point that we're gonna talk about here. Um, you know, I, we've heard a lot from, from folks of that that is one of the major concerns and this would obviously create a pretty significant burden for borrowers. Um, utilizing the 24 week period if they were otherwise thinking about uh, doing any ordinary course layoffs 
So we, we are hopeful that the SBA will be giving some additional relief and some other interpretations um, on that position, but I think it's important for people to know that, that the, way the, the way the rules are written and way, the way the Flexibility Act is written, at this point, you would be required to maintain your FTEs and your uh, salary levels through the covered period that you choose. So we, we can talk about that a little bit more if folks have questions, um, but that would be true unless you qualify for a safe harbor. And this is, this is where the, um, the Flexibility Act has made a couple of changes. Even if you did reduce your full-time equivalent employees or your salaries by more than 25% during your covered period, there's a safe harbor available under the original CARES Act that would allow you to avoid reducing your forgiveness um, as long as you restore salaries and FTEs by June 30th of 2020. Under the Flexibility Act, that deadline for rehiring employees has been changed, it's been extended to December 31st of 2020. Um, and the intent of this change is to give people more time to ramp back up to full employment um, in order to be able to take full advantage of their forgiveness. Um, but unfortunately also creates a few more questions with respect to, you know, does that, that means all of a sudden that, that the relevant date for me is now December 31 of 2020 instead of June 30th of 2020, and there, there are still some questions um, about that aspect of things. But the one other thing that I wanna cover uh, related to the Flexibility Act is that it, it creates a few more exemptions from loan forgiveness reduction for FTE reductions. We already had a couple of exemptions that were adopted before the Flexibility Act um, that provided that a, that a borrower would not be required to reduce their loan forgiveness if you make a genuine offer to rehire a previous employee and they decline to come back. So that was already an existing exemption. One thing I just want to note real quickly about that exemption, if you offer to rehire someone and uh, you, in order to get the relief that's provided for, you are also required to report that they declined your offer to the state unemployment office. Um, so that may have significance for employees who are otherwise on unemployment and it's an important point to keep in mind. Um, as, as you're thinking about your relationships with your employees. The other existing exemption uh, was for an employee who is fired for cause during your covered period or if they voluntarily resign or voluntarily take a cut in pay. So those exemptions were already out there before the Flexibility Act. Um, and then the Flexibility Act provided us with two additional exemptions from FTE loan reduction forgive loan forgiveness reduction. The inability to rehire exemption is essentially an exemption where you tried to rehire former unemployees and you just you weren't able to rehire those former those former employees or any similar employee. And the other additional exemption that I think is going to be pretty important for people is the COVID-19 inability to return to the same level of business activity exemption. And what that exemption says is that if you weren't, if you weren't able to open, if you were not able to bring people back to work because of uh, complying with, with guidance from the CDC or OSHA or HHS, um, then you, that won't count against you for loan forgiveness. So, I mean, that obviously is gonna be a big one for a lot of, a lot of folks who have been closed for uh, the last several months 
due to these guidelines. So that's what's new on the FTE loan reduction forgiveness side. So it sounds complicated, Drea. Um, just uh, w w one question for you uh, from me, uh, for example. So you're you're a restaurant, and you got to keep six feet of distance between your patrons. Uh, your seating capacity is cut by fifty percent. Um, I can open, but how do I determine what my exemption? from FTE reduction is uh, when I reduce my staff from 13 to nine um, because of the reduced patronage? Well, okay, so you, you in that situation, you are reducing your staff as a result of implementing the the guidelines put out by the CDC um, for for purposes of social distancing, and um, I mean I, I think it's going to be difficult to figure out the the actual numbers. And um, but I think you would be able to use that exemption, that FTE exemption, to justify the reduced amount of business that you're doing as a result of the of COVID-19 and the guidelines you're following. Um, but at this point, the question about exactly how you support that and exactly how you figure it remains open. And we are looking for additional guidance uh, and an additional amendment to the rules on forgiveness, which will hopefully flesh that out a little bit. And the updated application may also give us a little bit in more information on the technical aspect of how you calculate that. Thank you. It sounds like uh, quite a bit more math for some borrowers um, and be very interesting to see what type of help we get with those calculations. Uh, speaking of calculations, for borrowers who choose to use an eight-week covered period, do they have the option to continue relying on June 30, 2020 as their safe harbor date for bringing back employees? So that would make logical sense, Jeff, um, but that is not what the law says now. Um, we are hoping and expecting that the SBA will issue a new a new IFR or a new Q&A that will clarify that the June 30, 2020 safe harbor date still stands for restoring FTEs and salaries for borrowers who select an eight week covered period. Um, but as it stands now under the Flexibility Act and the amended IFR that, that came out last week, the safe harbor date goes away and becomes December 31st. So we're looking for more guidance and, and we hope that will come through. Okay, additional FAQs and IFRs to keep an eye out for. Um, and Ferdy, uh, back to you. Um, as the loan program continues to unfold, what do you think the key is uh, will be for the SBA focus upon any audit? Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to say for certain. And, you know, we were, we were just talking before we started broadcasting that the, the SBA has noted that it's going to provide additional guidance on how it plans to audit different borrowers. But um, to date, the, the SBA has stated in its FAQ guidance that it plans to review each individual loan file for all loans that were greater than $2 million. Um, so, you know, if you've received a loan of two million or more, you should expect that the SBA will ask questions about your necessity certification. Um, we've put together a, a timeline of the market conditions and governmental orders in Oregon and Washington um, from March through May that kind of provide some documented evidence of the substantial economic uncertainty throughout the pandemic. and. 
it can kind of serve as a, a tool to help you plan to respond to those questions from the SBA. Um, so you, you can find that document at our COVID-19 Resource Center at Tonkin.com or feel free to shoot me an email, I'm happy to send it over to you. Um, and I think in addition to that, um, one other thing I think the SBA may focus on is borrowers who have received loans through multiple entities. Um, I think if that's the case, you're probably going to want to prepare to answer questions about your eligibility and the affiliation analysis. Um, but you know, with that being said, the, the SBA has processed over four and a half million loan applications um, just over the past few months, and they're used to processing about 50,000 on an annual basis. So, you know, the, the practical question of how the SBA will have the, the resources and the infrastructure to extensively review these loans kind of remains unclear at this point. Thanks, Ferdy. And, and continuing on with the issue of audit, uh, as it's been a, a primary uh, area of concern for our clients, um, what can borrowers do now to prepare for and protect themselves uh, with respect to a future audit? Yeah, so I, I think the most important thing throughout this process is to really just keep meticulous records of everything regarding the loan and to have a point person who is constantly maintaining a file of the company's rationale for, for each decision regarding the loan and the dates on which those decisions were made. Um, you know, you're gonna want someone who's keeping track of uh, financial projections of the business, uh, dates that employees are terminated, furloughed or, or rehired, um, and, and anything else that, that really substantially impacts the operations of the business, because all of those are gonna be really crucial uh, if the SBA comes knocking on your door. Um, and you just need to make sure you're continuously updating that file. I mean, clearly the, the SBA guidance has been rapidly and constantly changing since the get-go of this program. So, you know, it's just really important to meticulously document what decisions you're making and, and when to, to make sure you have that support to back yourself up. Thanks, Freddie, and, and potentially uh, an additional consideration as uh, borrowers consider the eight versus 24 week uh, cover period. I mean, you've got another four months of documentation and potential federal oversight uh, of your activities that you need to pay, pay attention to um, if you are subject to the, the 24 week period. So, um, you know, work to be done uh, through that extended period if you take advantage of it. Uh, and with that, I, I think we'll um, wrap up uh, this portion of the program and, and turn to questions that we uh, received uh, both previous to uh, today and, and uh, today. I've got a good list of questions here um, following up on uh, a number of the topics that we've touched on uh, so far today. Um, <clears throat> Drea, maybe I'll um, start with you. Um, and this question is, what, what if I decide to use the 24 week uh, covered period, but I use all my loan funds in 12 weeks, can I go ahead and apply for forgiveness uh, after the 12 weeks? That's a great question, Jeff. Um, and so far, based on what we know, you either need to use the eight week period and apply after the end of the eight week period or the full 24 week period. However, um, there have been comments. Uh, so the Treasury Secretary made comments last week uh, suggesting that borrowers should be able to apply for forgiveness as soon as they have used all of their funds. So I am 
hopeful, again, that we may get some additional SBA guidance with that would actually say that you can use a, a let's say you can use a 12 week covered period and apply for forgiveness during as soon as you reach that 12 weeks um, and have used the, those funds. Um, but we, again, we need some, some additional guidance to, to allow us to do that. No interim flexibility today. We'll keep an eye out. And I just want to remind people that if you have questions now, uh, you're able to get them to us through the Q and A uh, function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you click on that and type in a question, that'll get into the queue here, and we'll we'll take a look and uh, provide a response uh, either live here now or uh, follow up with you uh, after the program today. Um, Pretty, I'm gonna. Um, I'm going to direct this next question to you, uh, and, and a, uh, you know, a real regular question I would say that we've been addressing uh, over the last several weeks, and that is, my business has performed a lot better than I thought it would when I first took out my PPP loan. Is that a problem for my necessity certification, and should I consider returning my loan? Yeah. So the you really look at the circumstances that you made the necessity certification at the time you made it. So, you know, at the time you applied for the loan, I'm sure there was a lot of unpredictability going on. If you, if, if you made it earlier on in the process, it was right in the midst of the pandemic, there was a ton of economic uncertainty. Um, so, and, and it'll, they'll look at the time that you made the certification. So even if your business has done okay later on or better than expected, you should still be okay. And in addition to that, if, if your loan amount is below $2 million, the, the SBA has noted that you're, you will be deemed to have made the necessity certification in good faith. So it, the necessity certification really just becomes a worry if, if your loan is 2 million or more. Um, so those are kind of all the things to think about with that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push on that a little bit more. Um, what does necessity mean in this context? What type of guidance do we have about when a loan is necessary because of economic uh, uncertainty? Yeah, so that's, it's an interesting question because initially when the CARES Act was enacted, there was a provision that said you, a borrower did not have to have uh, liquidity elsewhere to be eligible for the loan. But then the SBA came out with subsequent guidance in, in the, uh, the backlash of all public companies and, and, and larger companies that have access to capital um, taking advantage of the loan program. They basically said, you know, if you had substantial uh, access to liquidity, then you should return your loan funds. Um, but that that guidance came out sometime in mid to late April, and if if that was if that was after you you'd made the necessity certification, then they can't really apply that before when when you had applied the what the rules were before. So it's it's kind of a complicated question. Um, I don't know if you have any further thoughts on that, Jeff. Well. I, uh... I guess a few things. One is I think it's a standard that's impossible to define. Um, I, I think that uh, the PPP was adopted to specifically exclude the no credit elsewhere um, requirements of typical SBA loans. That's you know part of the statute. And then as uh, the program played out, significant public companies, private equity companies, franchises, and the like took a bunch of money, and the SBA and Treasury said, wait, 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 and, and crafted um, a standard which is, I think, remarkably difficult to, again, understand and apply. What does it mean? How do you measure it? Um, 
you know, how, how is the SBA going to apply it? Uh, and, and really, you know, I think there was a lot of concern about uh, violating federal loan standards and, and making misrepresentations. And, and, you know, the SBA has made it pretty clear, at least for everybody under the $2 million, and uh, that that's not going to be the case as you describe. Uh, but, but then you get to the guts of forgiveness. And how was the SBA going to apply the standards in uh, examining for forgiveness? And I think you're right as a legal matter that it's not fair to apply standards that were adopted subsequent to a certification, to a prior certification. But as a practical matter, are they going to do that anyway? Um, I think is an open question. And I think that there's going to be a lot of fights about that issue, um, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time if uh, the SBA respects the directives that um, they put out and have stated in many uh, instances that it's, you know, the rules that were in place at the time that you made the certification, and if they stand by that, then, you know, the early borrowers are all going to be fine prior to this um, standard being adopted, but, but we'll see. Um, I think how that plays out. Uh, but but to your point on audit, um, I think it's very important uh, that that decision be documented with the information available to the business at the time the decision was made, just like any other good documented business decision. And, and you know, that's not um, what many businesses likely did because the circumstances were so unusual with things being shut down and there being, you know, a, a literal crisis situation that, you know, business process was just different. So I, I think that with regard to that particular issue and many others with the PPP, it makes a lot of sense to go back and to the extent that decisions weren't fully documented at the time made do it now or as soon as possible while the information is fresh and good. Um, let me go then back to our list. <clears throat> Here's an interesting uh, question and Andrea, maybe I'll kick this to you and Ferdy can jump in uh, if, if it makes sense. And, and that's, um, Andrea, you talked about compensation and bonuses. Um, and there, we've had a lot of questions about payment of bonuses, what's going to be uh, forgivable, what's not. A question here for bonuses that cover six months but become payable in the covered period. Can the whole bonus be paid with PPP funds or only a pro rated uh, portion of the bonus? Based on the language of the rules, uh, the, the, it, in order to be forgivable, the payroll cost only needs to be paid or incurred during the covered period. So um, even if it relates to an earlier period, like the six weeks period prior to the bonus, um, that should be includable as, as, a, as, a, as an eligible payroll cost for purposes of loan forgiveness. Yeah, I, I think the the guidance has made clear that um, you know hazard bonuses and, and similar COVID nineteen bonuses are eligible for forgiveness. I think as as long as the employee is you know making less than a hundred thousand dollars on an annual basis, then it's okay. Yeah, and I mean, and that's that's actually an important clarification. Just to um, I mean, basically in all cases. Uh, across these rules, you are pretty consistently either going to need to uh, ratchet things down to where to where folks are not making more than a hundred thousand um, dollars on an annualized basis in order to have in order to have those compensation payments eligible, um, and that shows up in a number of places throughout the rules. So that's an it's an important caveat to be aware of. Uh, 
Uh, here's a question that I have received um, from a number of clients um, and, and it was surprising me um, initially, and that is, uh, Andrea, maybe I'll start with you on this one. What is the deadline to apply for forgiveness? Yeah, another great question. And of course, whenever I say something is a good question, that, that means that it, that's because it hasn't been very clear up until this point. So what, what we know right now is that if you apply for forgiveness within 10 months after the end of your loan forgiveness covered period, then you will not need to begin paying on the loan. But if you don't apply within that 10 month period, then you need to start paying on the loan um, in, a, in accordance with, a, with the, the loan schedule. So I think as a practical matter, the deadline will be 10 months after the end of your covered period to apply. So, and, and, and one um, practical outcome of that answer is even if you were to determine to use the eight-week covered period, you could conceivably go out past the 24-week period and choose to compare the two and apply for forgiveness based on an eight-week covered period. Did I get that right or did I confuse all of that? I'm just, I'm gonna um, say it again to make sure that I'm, I'm understanding correctly. Um, so I, I believe that you said that, so let's say you initially decide that you think that probably an eight week covered period is the right period for you and for your business. But you, you wait to apply. You don't, you don't apply immediately after the end of your eight week covered period. Instead, you actually, you know, you wait the, the 24 weeks and see which, which covered period actually makes sense for you at the end of that time. But then you decide that the eight week covered period is still the period that makes sense for you. Because that falls within the 10 month window following the end of your eight week covered period. Yes, I think you can still at that point, you can wait um, until the end of the 24 week covered period, see which covered period makes the most sense for you. And if you still wanna go with the eight week covered period, you should be able to do that as long as you apply for forgiveness within 10 months after the end of that eight weeks. I'm sure that's clear as mud, but I'm happy to uh, go over that with anyone personally if helpful. I thought that was really good, Drea. Um, my, my point in bringing it up is that there is some flexibility in waiting. Uh, there's also some risk. Uh, yeah, frankly, with this program, you don't know if the additional guidance is going to be positive or negative. Um, and, you know, to the extent that, uh, Dre, as I think you mentioned earlier, uh, you've used the money uh, under what we know, it appears to be clearly forgivable. Um, you know, there's certainly some motivation to seek forgiveness while uh, you've, you've got the clarity that you have and, and be done with it, uh, take the loan off the books, um, stop needing to monitor your activities and worry about the continuation of a federal loan. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, are a number of areas in which additional flexibility might be provided um, and, and there might be benefits coming. Um, and to the extent you know, you don't know immediately now, I guess that there's a couple, I'm sort of paraphrasing a couple of questions in here. 
Uh, but the answer is you don't have to choose right now. Uh, you can wait. There's not a deadline that's immediate. Um, and you can see how things uh, play out on the regulatory front um, while uh, you know the weeks go by and, and you think about which covered period's the best and, and how you document uh, forgiveness. Uh, good question here. Freddie, I'm going to throw this one to you, uh, give you a chance to jump in. And, th and that is, if I choose to stay with the eight-week period, do I also fall under the 75-25 uh, payroll versus non-payroll ratio? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer is no. The the 60-40 ratio applies to all loans now moving forward. So, um, yeah, only 60% has to be attributed to payroll for that. Drea, this one is for you on FTEs, uh, touching on something you spoke to you uh, earlier, how does the PPP handle an FTE leaving voluntarily? Does that affect forgiveness? No. The voluntary departure of an employee is one of the exemptions that is available for folks. And from a practical standpoint, essentially what you would be able to do when you're counting your FTEs if you've had someone voluntarily resign is you just you'll be able to just go ahead and count that person as a as a as a 1.0 full-time equivalent employee um, so no that should not affect the forgiveness of your loan Thank you. Uh, Ferdy, my loan was approved last week. Can I elect to use an eight week covered period? If it was, <laughs> if it was after the fifth, then no. <laughs> but if it was before the fifth, then oh yeah. So what, what are we at June 16th? So it couldn't have been before the fifth. <laughs> yeah, so no, you have to go with a 24 week period then. So the point is that the eight week alternative is only available to borrowers with funded loans prior to the June 5th uh, amending act. And that if you had a loan funded prior to that date, go ahead and consider use of the eight weeks uh, on or after June 5th then subject to the 24 weeks with some of the uh, concerns and considerations uh, that we've spoken to. Um, Ferdy, here's a question for you on payroll versus non-payroll costs. What is included in transportation for qualified non-payroll costs? So, and I'm gonna steal Drea's use of, that's a great question. Um, I think this is another one that the SBA hasn't really given much guidance on. I think they've indicated that um, fuel for a company car could be included. Um, I think probably employer paid Metro cards could probably also be included, but this is another item that the SBA hasn't really been clear on and everybody's kind of waiting on additional guidance on that one. Drea, um, why don't we take one more question here and then wrap up uh, our hour. Um, question for you. If we hire employees that were previously let go, do we need to give them back pay as if they had never been let go? And if so, what if they collected unemployment? 
sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, no, you do not need to pay back pay to employees that were previously let go. And it's, it is fine if they collected unemployment in the interim and then you bring them back. Um, I mean, a, a, you know, a big purpose of this act is to, is to keep people working and that includes getting people back to work. Um, so that's not going to disqualify you and you don't need to pay back pay like as if they had never left in order in order to qualify. Um, you just need to, you know, make sure that that you get your your salary levels back up to the more or less the average salary levels and you get your FTEs back up. But no, you don't need to pay back pay. And another just to add on to that, Dre, I think back pay can still be forgiven if it's paid in the covered period, right? So I think the I think you're you're highlighting the issue that you know relates to so if if someone um, let's say you paid your you had payroll on the first day that you that you received your PPP loan and you actually paid payroll on that day, but everything um, in that payroll relates to a period prior to the beginning of your covered period. By virtue of the fact that you paid it during the covered period, it would be eligible for, for forgiveness even though, even though it is for a previous period. I think the, the, it gets murkier if you're, if you're suggesting that you could actually you know, start paying people for periods before, um, or like significantly before your covered period and um and and it's not in the ordinary course i'd be careful about about doing that um but ordinary course payroll that's paid during the covered period is forgivable cool thanks so at least where i'm sitting the sun has come out uh which i'm gonna uh, take is shining on us, having gotten through another hour talking about PPP loan forgiveness. This is the third time. As I mentioned, we'll do it a couple of more times. There's further guidance coming out about audit considerations. There's uh, further guidance likely to be coming out about safe harbor dates. Uh, many of these counting issues that um, seem to be somewhat endlessly complex. I think we'll see additional guidance on those things. Uh, in the interim, I would point you to the Tonkin website. Uh, there's good uh, material posted on audit to uh, some of the topics Ferdy was speaking to. There's uh, how to get ready um, for a loan forgiveness application filing. Um, there's good materials on economic uncertainty so in preparing to make application for loan forgiveness, uh, put documents together, I think a lot of good uh, background information there. Uh, also with regard to uh, the loan certification issues, certainty, uh, necessity uh, for PPP funding. I think there's good background on those issues too. Um, but with that, I wanna wrap up, thank Drea and Ferdy for their participation here today. Thank everyone. Uh, on the line for attending and we look forward to next time. Everybody, thanks. Thanks.